All right, well, as Steve mentioned at the beginning of our service, we've returned to our sermon series on 1 Corinthians. We returned there last week after taking a six-week break for our vision campaign, and we're in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, you can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles if you, if you brought them, or if you like, you can grab a blue Bible under the chairs in front of you. You can find that on page 933 of those blue Bibles. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 15 is a beautiful chapter of the Bible. Um, the whole chapter is about the resurrection. And, and, and so it's a chapter filled with hope and joy for our future. Uh, it gives encouragement in our present, no matter how challenging our circumstances may be, because we know the end of the story, the glory that awaits us in eternity. Perhaps you've heard the expression, uh, you're so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Uh, that statement is getting at the idea that someone could be so focused on spiritual things that they neglect their practical responsibilities in the world. And, and uh, I suppose that it's possible for someone to so have their head in the clouds that that would be true. But if that's the case, they wouldn't be thinking about a biblical view of eternity. Paul, the author of 1 Corinthians, would tell us that a proper orientation towards eternity is the very thing that informs how he engages in the world. It's the thing that encourages him to press on when it's hard um, and to not grow weary and doing good in the here and now. That's how he'll end this chapter. Don't grow weary in doing good because of the resurrection. We're taking up this chapter in three sermons. Last week, Peter looked at the first 11 verses, which stressed the importance of the gospel. This was of first importance, Paul said. Uh, the good news of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, which Paul said was witnessed by more than 500 people who saw Jesus appear to them after his resurrection in the weeks following. Today, we'll look at verses 12 to 34 which underscore the necessity of the resurrection for our faith. And next week, Peter will finish the chapter, which addresses the nature of the resurrection. And so let's pick up in verse 12 this morning. And if you're able, please stand for the reading of God's word. This, 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 34. This is the word of the Lord. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, if in fact the dead, he, he did not raise him, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive, but each in turn. Christ, the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for how your word teaches us about things like resurrection. Lord, uh, stir up our hope in these things. Father, inspire faith and trust in you uh, in an ongoing way for those of us who are following you. And Lord, perhaps for the first time today, for those who might not yet know you. Lord, I pray that uh, you would speak to us by your spirit through your word that we might grow in our faith and be in, encouraged and inspired by our hope. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, the issue of whether or not Jesus was actually raised bodily from the dead is of utmost importance. It has tremendous implications. And in this passage, Paul is going to show us, on one hand, the foolishness of, of believing in a still dead Jesus, and on the other hand, the incredible benefits of believing in a risen Jesus. And so first, uh, let's look at uh, the first point. If Jesus wasn't raised, was not raised, Paul would say Christianity is a complete waste of time. Complete waste of time. Even though, Jesus, or even though um, Paul began the chapter talking about the importance of the resurrection, it's not until we get to verse 12, the beginning of our passage today, that we understand why Paul wrote this chapter. Evidently, there were some in the church of Corinth who were denying the resurrection. Now, resurrection doesn't simply mean life after death in some general generic sense. Uh, it has a very specific meaning in the Bible. It refers to raising the whole person, body and soul, to a new eternal life. It, it meant that those who were already dead in faith, uh, Christians, they would be given a new, in, uh, incorruptible, immortal body uh, where they would live in the presence of God for eternity in the new creation. And from verse 13, maybe earlier in the passage, it seems like they didn't necessarily deny that Jesus was raised from the dead, but they were denying that anyone else would be raised from the dead. It seems some of them thought Jesus' resurrection was kind of a one-off, right? It didn't really apply to the rest of us. It's possible that these ancient Greeks here in Corinth were influenced by pagan philosophies that were just all around them in their culture, uh, the philosophies of the time. Uh, for example, some of them would teach that uh, what is physical is bad and what is spiritual is good. And so because of this, um, some people thought that the body, our physical bodies were just inherently corrupt and acted as a sort of prison house for the soul. And, and they thought that when you died, your immortal soul would be set free from your body and your body would decay and stay dead forever. So it's possible they were influenced by thinking like that. It's also possible, based on what Paul writes earlier in this letter, in chapters four, five, and six, that some of them thought that this general resurrection of believers had already happened. It happened perhaps when they were saved. Again, it was, it was this idea of a spiritual resurrection that, uh, that only affected your soul, and so it didn't matter what you did with your body. Well, regardless, of why or precisely what these people thought, it's clear that they were rejecting the idea that believers in Jesus, and therefore everyone for that matter, aside from Jesus, they're denying that idea that, that we would be bodily raised from the dead. And so influenced by thinking from their wider culture, uh, perhaps they thought this idea of a bodily resurrection was embarrassing. Uh, it was implausible maybe even inappropriate. They didn't think it mattered very much and they just wanted to drop it. Well, people in our day reject the idea of bodily resurrection as well, probably for different reasons. For example, in the 19th and 20th century, we saw a shift away from 
um, from the traditional understanding of resurrection in some traditions of Christianity. Um, Embarrassed, perhaps, by the presence of miracles in the Bible, uh, certain scholars wanted to reinvent Christianity uh, to be consistent with a modern naturalistic worldview where everything important could be explained by science. And so core concepts like resurrection were reinterpreted uh, and, and understood in other kind of spiritual terms. You know, resurrection might mean Jesus continuing to live in our hearts or uh, the, the, the cause of God continuing in the world um, in the name of Jesus after his death. Ideas like that might be appropriate if Jesus was simply one guru among many, right? If he was merely teaching a way to God that you could choose to follow if you wanted to. But biblical Christianity is something very different. Biblical Christianity is not merely a set of ideas or moral principles to follow. It's not a political agenda. It isn't concerned merely with generic life after death. It speaks to all of those things, but biblical Christianity is different. It's good news about an event that has happened in the world in time and space. It's good news about an an event in history, an event so significant that the world can never be the same again. And and those who believe it and live by it will never be the same again either. The gospel which Paul and others announced was that Jesus was Israel's Messiah and therefore the world's true king and he had come to save his people and fix everything Everything that's wrong with the world, everything that's broken will be remade. And the evidence that Jesus is this God-sent king is that God raised him from the dead, demonstrating God's power over sin and death and everything else that's wrong with the world. If there is no resurrection, there's no fix for the world. N.T. Wright has said that those who deny the resurrection are not just tinkering with one negotiable element of Christian belief. No, they're cutting off the branch on which the gospel and those who embrace it are sitting. It's catastrophic. And so Paul is aghast when he hears this news of what the Corinthians are thinking. And he explains in this passage what would follow logically if there were no resurrection. Verses 13 and 16. If in principle the dead are not resurrected, then Jesus hasn't been raised either. You can't have your feet in both worlds, right? If it's inappropriate because the physical body is somehow evil, then it's inappropriate for Jesus to be resurrected. If it's impossible for the dead to be raised to life again, then why would they affirm that it happened to Jesus? But if it did happen to Jesus, why not us too? Verse 14, if Christ hasn't been raised, Paul's preaching, the New Testament as a whole, for that matter, is useless because biblical faith is grounded on the claim that these events happened in history. And so verses 14 and 17, if Christ hasn't been raised, your faith is useless. It is utterly futile. Why? You know, we live in a world today where most people say it doesn't really matter what you believe so long as you're sincere in your belief. Nonsense. I mean, this is ridiculous. All the faith in the world will not allow you to jump across the Grand Canyon on your own power. You know, you might have faith that the ice on a lake is thick enough to hold you up if you walk across, but if it's too thin, you'll fall through. It doesn't matter what you believe. Faith is pointless if it doesn't correspond to reality. And Paul understood that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then all of us are still in our sins. Because the proof that Christ's death was an effective substitutionary atonement where he takes our sin away and gives us his righteousness, the proof of that is his resurrection. Why is that proof? Well, I mean, besides pretty cool, <laughs> but, but theologically, the scriptures consistently teach that the wages of sin is death. Death is a result of sin. 
And, and so if death has been defeated, it must mean that sin has been defeated as well. And so if Jesus is still physically dead, we're still spiritually dead because his death must not have overcome the effects of sin. Verse 15, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, all the apostles are liars because they taught that he did. They claim to have seen him after his resurrection. Verse 18, if Jesus didn't rise, there's no hope for our deceased loved ones who followed Jesus either. They're lost forever. In verse 29, skipping towards the end, he adds another reason. It's kind of an interesting one. If the dead are not raised, why are people baptized for the dead? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> this is the only place in the Bible that mentions this, and Paul doesn't explain it, and he doesn't commend it either. It was just a practice that he acknowledges that they were doing, whatever it might have meant. But even though we don't know what that meant or what it was for, we understand Paul's point here. Right? Paul is telling them it makes no sense to do it if there were no resurrection. He's pointing out their inconsistency. And then finally in verses 19 and then down again in verses 30 to 32, if Jesus didn't, didn't rise, what in the world are we doing here? <laughs> like, why are we doing this? From one perspective, you might say if Christianity is not true, well, we're no worse off, right? Kind of hedging our bets. Um, it might even lead to a wholesome life. But for Paul, for many like him, in that day and throughout history around the world, they suffered intensely for their faith. To face persecution and suffering and martyrdom for a false faith is senseless. In verse 30, Paul says that he endangers himself every hour for the sake of his faith. In verse 31, he says he faces death every day. In verse 32, it's, it's probably a metaphorical reference to the fierce opposition that he faced when he was in Ephesus. Uh, that's described in Acts 19. Um, Paul is saying, it's like I was thrown into the arena to fight wild beasts. Listen to how he describes what he experienced precisely because of his ministry. He didn't experience these things when he was not a follower of Jesus. But once he started following Jesus and telling other people about him, this was his life, 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and I have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Paul knows firsthand and he says, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead and this is all there is, of all people we are to be most pitied. All of these arguments are implications of what would follow if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. But Paul doesn't believe any of that for a moment. Paul has seen the resurrected Jesus and, and with Jesus' resurrection, a whole new world has opened up in which the all-embracing power of sin and death is overcome. There's a way to a new life that is greater and more beautiful and more powerful than the life we've been experiencing. And Paul makes two main points about that in this passage, verses 20 through 28. And the first is because Jesus was raised, his people will be too. Having addressed the futility of the alternative, Paul writes in verse 20, but Christ. Right? That sounds a lot like, but God, right? Those are gospel words. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ's resurrection changes everything. When Jesus walked out of that tomb on Easter morning, it was a different world. 
For one, he is the forerunner and the evidence that those who follow him by faith will be raised from the dead as well. First fruits, this is uh, um, in, in ancient Jewish culture in the Old, Old Testament, this was the part of the crop, the first part of the crop that would emerge each season. And the first, fruit, the first fruits were given as an offering to God, as thanksgiving. They were also celebrated because they signified that the rest of the harvest was coming soon. It was going to follow. By saying that Jesus' resurrection is the first fruits of those who have died, Paul is saying that just like the first fruits indicates the nature of the, of the crop, the quality of the crop, for the rest of the crop, Jesus' resurrection life gives us a picture, a foretaste of what the resurrected life of believers will look like. Jesus' resurrection undoes, as it were, sin and corruption and death brought on us through Adam. Theologians speak of this, this concept called uh, the federal headship of Adam. I don't, I don't know if you've heard that term before. But what that means is that God designated Adam as the first human to be the federal head, or we might say the covenant representative of all of humanity who would follow him. Much like a political leader might make a treaty um, binding the entire nation together by that, by that leader's actions. In, in verses 21 and 22, Paul explains that all of us die because he says we are in Adam. Or we're, in other words, we're represented by Adam so that we inherit his sin, his, his death, his corruption. But Paul says that God sent Jesus as the Messiah to be, in other places, the second Adam or the last Adam to overturn those effects. And so where Adam's disobedience brought sin and death to humanity, Christ's obedience and sacrificial death on the cross pays the penalty for our sin, and his resurrection overturns the death that we experienced as a consequence of the fall. His resurrection brings life to those who are in Christ by faith. And that's why Christ's death and resurrection are essential if God is gonna fix the world, if God is gonna overturn and save us from all of the effects of the fall. A human got us into this mess, and a human, the God-man, Jesus, would get us out of it. But don't miss this. That statement, in verse 22, he says, in Christ all will be made alive, that statement is qualified by two phrases in this passage. And the first is the, the little phrase, in Christ. Verse 22, this is a common saying of Paul. He probably says, in Christ, by Christ, through Christ, in him, like some variation of this phrase. He probably says that more than any other thing he says in all of his writings. And essentially what he means by that is that to be in Christ is to be in union with Christ is to have this spiritual, kind of mystical connection with Jesus so that what is true of Jesus is true of us. Because he died to sin, we've died to sin. Because he rose from the dead, we are free and, and raised to new life and one day we'll be resurrected as well. And the way that we become connected to Jesus in this way, the way that we are in Christ is through faith in him. Romans 3 says this righteousness um, that is given to us in the gospel is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile, any person, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus through faith, by faith. And so to have faith in Jesus in this way means that you understand the gospel. 
right? It means that, that uh, you understand that your sin separates you from God, that you deserve God's judgment because of your sin, but through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, God has taken away your sin and made you righteous and adopted you into his family and reconciled to God and given you eternal life. You understand the gospel message, but it also means that you believe it's true. And furthermore, that not only you understand it and believe it to be true, that alone would qualify you to be a demon because the Bible says that demons understand this as well. Even more than that, you're trusting in this reality. You're trusting that Jesus is the only one who can make you right with God. The second phrase that qualifies this this statement, in Christ all will be made alive, is found in verse 23. Uh, And it's this, those who belong to him. These are the ones who will be resurrected in the way Paul is describing. It's those who belong to Jesus. In other words, those who have faith, who believe in and trust Jesus, are those who belong to Jesus. And it's all of those people who are trusting in Christ in this way who Jesus will return for at the end of the age to resurrect and to be with God forever. And so here's the most important question you can ask yourself. Are you in Christ by faith? Said another way, are you one of Jesus' people? Because Jesus was raised, his people will be too. If you're not, we're glad that you're here. And and I would urge you to consider these things. Uh, You can be. You can be one of Jesus' people. Simply express your faith to Christ. Ask him to save you because of his grace and, 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 and to forgive your sins and to make you one of, of God's children. There'll be a time after the sermon where you can pray. You can express that in prayer. You can do just that. Not only will Jesus resurrect his people, Paul also says, the third point, because Jesus was raised, he'll come again to make everything right again. He'll come again to renew the world and to make a perfect place for all of us to live together with him in harmony forever, for eternity. And Paul speaks of a sequence here. I, I wish we had time to unpack this more than I'm able to this morning, but, but uh, Jesus was raised in the middle of history. That was a big shock. Everybody who believed in a resurrection from a Jewish background expected that to happen at the end of the age, before the eternal state, but Jesus was resurrected in the middle of history. The first fruits of those who would follow. And because he was, Paul says, he'll return, he'll come again. When will he do that? He'll do that at the end of the age, right? Uh, He'll come again for his people at the end of history. And that's when the rest of us will be raised. Because Jesus was raised in the middle of history, his people will be raised at the end of history when he returns at his second coming. And in the meantime, when believers die, their souls immediately go into the presence of God Their bodies are corrupted, but we await, we wait for that time of resurrection. This disembodied state is only temporary. It's not the ultimate reality. When Jesus returns, our bodies will be resurrected and reunited with our souls forever. We'll live an embodied spiritual existence in the presence of God forever. And so this present age is an age of waiting and, and waiting is hard. There's groaning. There, there is the death of loved ones and even, even ourselves. Uh, we long for things to be made new, but we wait in hope. Just like knowing that the rest of the crop will follow because the first fruits have been gathered. Just like knowing that we'll hear thunder after seeing a flash of lightning. It's inevitable. It's guaranteed, it's going to happen because Jesus is the first fruits. He has raised from the dead. Paul goes on, he says, when Jesus does return, he'll conquer all things that oppose God's perfect reign. It says that he's reigning now, but not all things have bowed the knee to Jesus yet. When he comes again, that will be the case. All demonic, all social, political, economic, ethical, spiritual opposition, all opposition to the kingdom of God will be vanquished 
by King Jesus, there will be nothing that is inconsistent with the perfect reign and rule of God on earth as it is in heaven. And, and the last enemy to be defeated will be death itself. And once he has put the world back to right, where everything is the way it ought to be, he'll offer it all to God the Father so that God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit may be all in all. Then the saying will come true. Revelation 21, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. That's our hope. That's the hope of the Christian life. And it's all contingent on Jesus' resurrection. And so Paul wants to be crystal clear that the resurrection is the rock bottom reality for the Christian life. He didn't make it up, he received it. We saw that last week. Uh, It's the good news that has been passed down and he and all of the apostles tell the same story, he says. If it's not true, Christianity is a complete waste of time. But because it is true, we know that those who have faith in Christ will one day be resurrected with him and will spend eternity when he comes again in a perfect world in the presence of God forever. But this is not just an idea for the future, as I said. The hope of the resurrection is exactly what we need to motivate us for faithful living today and every day. Verses 33 and 34 offer a pointed application, a rebuke that Paul gives the Corinthian church. Since Jesus is reigning now and will come again, he says, don't live as if these things aren't true. Don't let the fallen, corrupted thinking and behaviors of the world around you mislead you. Embody the character of God's kingdom reign today in your life. Be consistent with this future reality that has broken into this world. And take heart through your struggles because you know the end of the story. Paul faced death every day, but he did not lose heart. Listen to what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter four. He says, therefore we do not lose heart though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. And look at how he describes those afflictions that I read before. He says, our light and momentary troubles, our light in, in, the, in the perspective of eternity, of the resurrection to come, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. And so how do we live today? We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. May you cling to the reality of Jesus' resurrection. Would you live with joy and hope in that day that is coming, whatever your present circumstances and hardships and troubles may be? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you that he entered into our world, that he became one of us, that he lived the life we should live but didn't, don't. He died the death we deserved so that we'll never have to experience separation from you. Lord, I pray for all of us here today that we would know this hope, that it would be an anchor to our souls. I pray for those who may be here that aren't yet trusting in this Savior. Lord, I pray that you would encourage them with this hope, with this truth, and that they too would place their faith in Christ. And Lord, for all of us, help us to live more and more consistently in light of your kingdom reality. Might we be a visible, tangible picture of what your future eternal kingdom is all about as your spirit changes us to be more like our risen savior. We pray this in his name, amen.